as Antonia introduced me. And I'm Francine Raphael, and we're here today to talk to you about various side effects and ways to manage them. Okay, so today we're going to talk about these topics here. I'm going to begin talking to you about infection. So as you know, chemotherapy is meant to target the bad cancer cells in our body. But unfortunately, chemotherapy also targets our good cells. One of our good cells that it targets is our white blood cells. White blood cells are a component of our, our, our blood cells here that's meant to fight bacteria, prevent infection. When you receive chemotherapy, you have a reduction in the amount of white blood cells that you have, so you put you at risk for infection. So very important, when you're getting chemotherapy, I always encourage all of my patients to ensure they have a thermometer at home. It's very important because one of the first signs and symptoms that you may experience is a temperature, which is 100.4. Of course, there's other symptoms of infection, which are chills, cough, difficulty urine, urinating. So there's some things that we can do all of ourselves to try to prevent infection when you're getting chemotherapy. Um, one of the biggest things that we can all do is washing your hands. And this goes for us as healthcare providers. This is one of the ways that we try to prevent giving infection to our patients is by making sure we're washing our hands very well. You also want to be careful of the kind of food that you're eating when you're going through chemotherapy. Now's the time to avoid the buffet. You want to make sure that you're not eating food that's been out for more than two hours. You want to make sure that you wash your produce as well. You want to make sure that you're eating from good reputable places. Um, it is probably a good time to avoid the food trucks as well. Anybody here like sushi? Okay. So unfortunately, as you go through this time of getting chemotherapy, sushi is one of the foods that we will discourage you from having because it's raw, it's not cooked. And we need to make sure that you're eating food that is cooked. So you also, your rare meat, you, if you're having a steak, it would need to be well done. Eggs would need to be cooked all the way through. These things we know can help prevent infection. So before we go to the next topic, any questions from the audience in terms of uh, infections, why blood cells, anything comes to mind? Okay. One thing I do want to also include about infection is Sometimes we know there are certain medications that put you at such a high risk for infection that there are, there's a medication that's included in your treatment to help increase the white blood cells. It tells your body to make more of these blood cells in your bone marrow. It helps support that. Um, and this is a similar medication can also be used in case you do become neutropenic, which is the same as having a low white blood cell count. However, this medication is not appropriate for every disease um, treatment to have it right away. Does anybody know what anemia is? Hmm? Anemia? Yes. Yes, diminishing of the uh, red blood cells and Ver the hematocrit. And the Very well. So anemia is when your um, amount of circulating red blood cells are decreased. And our red blood cells is what um, our body uses to circulate our oxygen here. Some types of chemotherapy can put you more at risk for anemia. Just like it can decrease your white blood cells, it can also your red blood cells. Some symptoms of anemia can be shortness of breath, trouble breathing, trouble with normal activity, um, feeling dizzy or faint, being pale. Sometimes you may even feel as if your heart is going faster because your heart is trying to move the blood volume that you have throughout your body so you can continue to be oxygenated. Typically, if you are become anemia, anemic, what we would do is do lab work. Um, and often the treatment can be a transfusion. 
So if you do feel these symptoms, you want to first talk to your doctor about that. Typically, we do redraw our patient's blood and check them for anemia, but you can experience it at any time. It's important to try to save your energy as well. So now's the time, it's perfectly okay to ask for help. Get your friends and family involved during this time because everyone, when you're going through this process, wants to know how they can help you. So you can tell them concretely, you can help me go grocery shopping or clean up. Save your energy, delegate, ask people to do things for you. It's also important to eat high protein foods and to eat foods with iron to support your blood. This leads us into our next symptom, which is fatigue. So many things can cause us to be fatigued. Um, we just talked about anemia. You can be you feeling tired because of that. But as you're going through chemotherapy, at times you may experience pain or depression, which can also have an impact on your energy level. There's also different medications and you know not sleeping so well or insomnia that can make you more prone to being fatigued. One thing that we know that can help with fatigue is exercise. And when I say exercise, I don't mean running a 15 mile uh, marathon as you're going through this process. We're talking about a 15 to 30 minute light exercise every single day you want to do. You want to rest when you're tired Again, ask other people for help. And you wanna limit your naps to about one hour. This isn't the time that you wanna rest and just stay in bed because we know that would make fatigue worse. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, I guess if you have to see what that is taken into consideration when you have chemo? Yes, yes it is. Um, so it is still encouraged that you exercise, but at the level that you're able to tolerate. We don't want you to do more than that and to rest when you're tired as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just a, a walk around the block will do it for you. you know, just get the red cells moving, give you a little, it actually makes you feel better rather than staying put. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about nausea and vomiting now. Nausea and vomiting tends to be the one side effect that most of us worry about when we know someone who's going to go through chemotherapy or been through chemotherapy. Nausea is the feeling when you feel sick to your stomach and you feel like you're going to throw up. Vomiting is the actual act. However, I'm happy to report that now we have many ways to prevent nausea. We have developed great regimens to prevent nausea. Many times you're prescribed multiple agents to prevent nausea before you receive your chemotherapy. But there's things that we can do without medication as well. You want to avoid certain foods that may trigger your nausea. This may be spicy, fried, greasy foods. It's very important to eat small, frequent meals. Again, I said before, now's not the time to go to the buffet. Now's the time to have smaller, high calorie meals um, throughout the day. And when I say how many, about five to six meals throughout the day. It's important that when you're drinking, that you do not gulp your beverages, but just take sips, because that can kind of put you more at risk of becoming nauseous. And this is a tip of my own to share with you. You do not want to eat your favorite foods when you are nauseous, because if you get sick from them, most likely they would no longer be your favorite food. <laughs> Um, here's just a couple of images that we put together here of some ideas of what you can have and drink if you're feeling nauseous or if you experience vomiting. Um, bland foods, um, crackers, rice, um, you can drink things such as, um, you don't just have to drink water, you can drink broth, you can drink Pedialyte. 
You can have a popsicle. These things would help manage the nausea. Some other things that you can do is uh, acupuncture. You can try that. Um, meditation are things that you can do without medication. Also about nausea, it's very important that you take your antiemetic or medication to prevent nausea um, as directed from your physician and your team. The one side effect about medication for nausea, the biggest is constipation. And constipation is when you're experiencing a reduction and your bowel movements are, it's harder for you to pass. We do not want you to become constipated while you're getting chemotherapy. So we have many ways to try to prevent the side effect from occurring. One thing that you can do before medication is you want to start off eating high fiber foods, drinking lots of fluid. And what I mean by lots of fluid is typically two liters a day. You want to be active, you want to exercise. Again, that 15 to 30 minutes, even if it's just a walk. And you want to communicate with your team if you haven't been able to pass the bowel movement in two days. But for some of us, two days is our normal. But for many of us, it's not. So when you're having a change in your ability to have a bowel movement, you want to let your team know. Many times we put medication, a plan in place for you as you're experiencing um, constipation. If you have a history of constipation, this is something that you would want to let your physician know as you're starting off this journey. Again, here's just some images of some things that you would want to have. High fiber foods, you want your broccoli, your green leafy vegetables, apples, prunes, nuts, whole grains, beans. Are there any questions about constipation or? All right, I'll give you the heaven here. Okay, so the next topic I will talk about is diarrhea. This can be a side effect of you know, chemotherapy, or it could be a pre-existing condition, especially some people who have irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Just adding on the chemotherapy agents, it can cause diarrhea. This is one of the symptoms we want you to report right away. And by diarrhea, I mean if by 10 o'clock in the morning you have three liquid movements. It does not seem like much, but that's how quickly you can become dehydrated. And that's one of the things that would, you would end up in a hospital. Our goal when we give our patients chemotherapy is for you to never see an emergency room. I always tell my patients, you're not sick, you're getting chemotherapy. So, on that note, if you have diarrhea, just like when you were a child and you were sick with the flu, we do the brat diet, banana, rice, applesauce, toast, and tea. You want to use, uh, have bland foods, and you, very important, you need to inform your physician, nurse practitioner, or nurse navigator. If it's, it is that you are having significant amount of diarrhea, they will have you come into the clinic, and we will give you hydration, and that will help you. And there are also agents that you can take for example, Imodium, which is over the counter, to counteract that. For patients that have the co comorbidity in having like irritable bowel syndrome or patients that have colon surgery, this is taken into consideration before they start chemo to they would tailor the regimen to avoid the chance of diarrhea. You, uh, when If you're experiencing diarrhea, we want you to to drink lots of fluids. We want you to drink fluids that are high in potassium and magnesium because these are some of the electrolytes you, you lose when you have lots of diarrhea. Avoid dairy products, avoid, again, avoid spicy foods, and you want to eat foods that bind you. So a good thing to have is rice. Any questions from the audience? 
Do you consider soy milk or almond milk also like the uh, same if it was milk? The soy, the soy milk, you, it, it, every individual is different. We find like the whole milk tends to give you diarrhea more, more so than the soy milk. So if you, if you absolutely need that milk in your coffee, we would tell you go with the soy milk. You can try that. Any other questions? to rice, strictly white rice, right? Yeah, because if you eat brown rice, that has more fiber and you'll actually go more. The white rice will actually help to bind you. You want things that's going to bind you. And I, do you have a question? Yeah, why rice though? It's empty calories. But it helps to bind you. It also has arsenic in it too. Well, it's that could, that could be the case, but you won't be eating it in a significant amount. We want something to really bind you. Get, you won't be having a complete diet of rice. This is, this is short term. We're talking, we want this to be resolved within a day or two. If it's longer than that, then they would prescribe medications that would help to stop the bowel movement. And also a lot of people would go to the sports drinks and like Gatorade. We don't normally recommend them because they're very high in sugar and high in salt. So we don't really want you to have those. Those are acti actually counterproductive. Any other questions? <clears throat> what about carbonated drinks? Yes, you can have <coughs> ginger ale. Ginger ale is very good. Actually, it helps with nausea. And it's also good, you can get, just, you just want to increase your fluid intake. So some patients like to drink the salsa water, they have the, the flavored salsa water, because that brings me to my next topic, which is appetite changes. Sometimes the chemotherapy, depending on the agent you get it, you have appetite uh, changes. Your taste buds are not quite the same. So. Rather than drinking plain water, some patients find if they drink carbonated water with a little zing, it is much easier to tolerate than just the plain water. Some patients, depending on the medication they're getting, will say that the water has a metallic taste. So sometimes you don't feel like eating, but it's very important, as Francine mentioned earlier, small freaking meat. So you can have, you can snack on crackers, cheese, peanut butter. You can, you, you, you can um, have ice cream or sorbet, you know. Now is the time you want to really get those calories like in. The ice cream bar. You like the ice cream bar? <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> you know, even some patients like that would have the supplements like Ensure, but if you've ever had Ensure, they're like, it doesn't taste that great. So, yes, and what I tell my patients is freeze it and have it as ice cream. When it's cold, you don't taste it, but you get the calories, but because they're really high calorie, and that is what you need to help, help you on the journey while you're having your chemotherapy. If you don't feel like eating, drink. You can make cream soups. You can get your calories in, you can make a potato soup, add a little cream in it, you get some extra calories that day, that way. You know, now it's winter is coming up, you know, get a nice, if you, everything else is fine, you get a nice uh, bowl of lentil soup, very high in iron, very good, very good. So the soups, you know, they're easy to tolerate, it doesn't take as much effort. And we also recommend not to have foods that are too hot or too cold. Re room temperature usually is the best. Sometimes sucking on a hard candy. If you're a diabetic, sugar-free hard candy. In general, some people like to use everything sugar-free. Some people think um, that having a lot of sugary items is counterproductive, but it's based on your diagnosis. Just to keep your mouth moist, because if your mouth get dry, you really don't feel like eating or drinking. So you, you can make smoothies you can put you can juice a lot of patients juice at that time you just want to make sure you're getting your calories and you don't get dehydrated mm? 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 Will you be 
recommend those um, protein in power that they sell in the healthy store? What is that? More protein to the diet the without the, uh, you know, coming to to drink and sure that it's uh, so sweet. Protein. Yeah, you can, you can make your own shakes. I usually tell my patients, like, leafy green vegetables are very high in iron. So you put your broccoli, your kale, you put an apple to get a good, some flavor. You add a little orange juice or a little flavor. If you prone to diarrhea and the milk, don't, you, don't add milk to it, you know? You could even, some people just put some sorbet instead. And you know, make it so that it's something you want to drink. You know, it's not like medicine, you have to force it down. Because it, you are correct, ensure it's very sweet. Would help if you repeat the question that's been asked. Okay, she asked if um, rather than making um, drinking the Ensure, if you can make your own drinks because Ensure is so sweet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you have any any other suggestions or questions? The, chemo, the chemotherapy acts on rapidly dividing cells. And the cells in your lining on your mouth divide very rapidly. So you are more prone to get mouth sores. And this is a time you want to do excellent mouth care. Your physician will usually recommend before you start chemotherapy to visit your dentist and get a good cleaning before you start your chemotherapy. So you want to use a soft toothbrush if you use mouthwash, we recommend that you do not use any mouthwashes with alcohol. But you don't have to go out and buy anything special. You can just do a, a simple mouthwash. If you don't do it, your mom did it. If your mom, definitely your grandma. It's just one uh, eight ounce glass of warm water, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, and one eight teaspoon of salt. You gargle with that four to six times a day, it keeps the mouth moist and prevent mouth sores. Because if you get mouth sores, it's painful, it's difficult to eat, and it's, it will impede your ability to take your treatment. Because if you don't eat, you don't get calories in, you don't feel well, and it's a domino effect. Also avoid citrus food, alcohol, spicy foods, and just generally be kind to yourself. Use nothing too hot, nothing too cold, just room temperature. The, the skin is the largest organ in our body. People tend to forget about that. The chemotherapy also affects your skin. It, it tends to it tends to dry out your skin. So this is for especially for the men in the audience because the women, we women, we moisturize. You don't have to tell us. For the men in the audience, when you're undergoing chemotherapy, we recommend that you moisturize well, head to toe, every part of your body, especially in the winter, because your skin tends to dry out more. Pay attention to your nails. You want to make sure that it's not cracking. Any, those are all port, ports of entry for infection. So you will notice when you come in, your nurse will take a look at your hands. If you have any brittle needs, we, we, we want you to really moisturize and pay attention. If you're having pain, pain in your fingernails, some of the chemotherapy can cause that. We want you to report it to your doctor as once. Any questions? What is moisturizing? like a lotion, you know, like uh, simple, something simple like Vaseline Intensive Care, you know. Some people like to use baby oil after the shower. You really want to put a barrier on your skin so you don't want it to be so dry so you can get, it, you can get cuts and bruises. That's an entry for infection. Infection is the most important important part. You do not want to get an infection while you're getting chemotherapy. It can become life-threatening. Because the white cells are your fighter cells and if, as Francine mentioned before, if they're low, which there will be from the chemotherapy, you want to make sure your skin is intact.
So just moisturize, get it part of your routine, and that will help to keep your skin intact. Usually, if you're doing chemotherapy, you won't have to shave. So before you tell our patients, don't use a straight razor, that's a moot point because with chemotherapy, you will you lose your hair. Most chemotherapy, there are others that you don't lose your hair from. So this brings me to my next topic, hair loss. Most of the chemotherapy will cause hair loss because the hair follicles are rapidly dividing. That's why the chemotherapy affects it. Usually, I tell patients um, to shave their head before it starts falling. It's some patients experience discomfort when the hair is coming out, they find that their scalp is very sore. You want, want to wash your hair or head with a mild shampoo like baby shampoo and you want to keep it covered. You're gonna, you can wear scarves, you wear a cotton hat. Uh, some women wear wigs, but you want to make sure you have a cotton cap under the wig to protect your head because your head tend to get very tem um, tender. You also want to protect your head from sunburn. Even in the winter, just the rays of the sun, when you're doing chemotherapy, you're more susceptible to sunburn. So you want to use sunblock on your body, also on your head, very important. Depending on the chemotherapy regimen you do, about two to three months after you complete your treatment, your hair will grow back. It's very rare instances you would have an, where your hair will not grow back. And the, your doctor will tell you that upfront if it's an agent that will cause permanent hair loss. Oh, yes. But most chemotherapies, after you finish treatment, your hair will grow back. Any questions in terms of hair loss? A printout that this is amazing. Sure, sure. Oh, good. So you yeah. have something you can take home. Yes, I can get you some. Yeah, oh no, we don't expect you to, but we have printers I can get for you. Okay. No, when you when you undergoing chemotherapy, we want you to live a normal life as possible. And that being said, sexuality is a very important part of that. Because you're having chemotherapy does not mean that you cannot be intimate with your partner. It's, you need to feel as normal as possible. You need to assure your partner that he or she is not going to hurt you. The most important thing is that you use the barrier method when you're having intercourse. It doesn't matter if that you're postmenopausal, you don't... The, the idea is that you excrete the chemotherapy in your bodily fluids so you don't want to, sh to expose your partner to that. So this, this could be a difficult topic if you're past childbearing age and you tell your husband, well, honey, we have to use a condom and he's going to be, why? And I have to have the conversation and say, because we want to protect you but we want you to continue doing everything that you normally do to feel as normal as possible. Another thing with women undergoing chemotherapy, especially the, key, the cancers that are fed by estrogen and progesterone, they have vaginal dryness. So you need to have that, kind, sometimes it's uncomfortable to talk to your doctors. You need to have that conversation with your doctor to prescribe something because women will shy away from being intimate with their partner because it hurts, but we want you to feel as normal as possible. It's, you know, you get a diagnosis of cancer and then you take away everything. That's not the way we want it to be. But it's very important when you speak, you speak to your doctor and just don't buy something over the counter because especially in the tumors that are fed by estrogen and progesterone, you don't want to use lubricants that have estrogen in it because it will be counterproductive. We're giving you chemotherapy, for example, in breast cancer, if it's estrogen, the tumor is estrogen positive, we give you chemotherapy to block that, but then if you're using a lubricant, you can 
absorb some of that estrogen. So it's very important you have that conversation with your physician. Keep in mind, for the men also, you, you, if you're undergoing chemotherapy, you're gonna use a, a, a barrier method. You're gonna move, use a condom when you're having intercourse to protect your partner. For number one, prevent pregnancy, and most important, to prevent exchanging the fluids with your partner. Men, especially for the, for the cancers that uh, affect the urinary tract and the sex organs, some of the chemotherapies can affect that. It's very important that you talk to your doctor. For example, we've come a far way with the prostate surgeries now that they can do nerve sparing. So in the past, men had a prostatectomy, that's the removal of the prostate. It was a given they wouldn't be able to have an erection. No, they can do surgery where they, they do nerve sparing and you can function as you did before. So we've come a long way, but you have to be very upfront. It is your body. You want to maintain it in as original form as possible. That is the only body you have. So talk to your doctor. Don't be shy. Talk to your doctor. You, you're not going to be asking them anything they've never heard before. Remember, chemotherapy affects everyone differently. These side effects, some people don't get it. Some people go through chemotherapy and they say to me, are you sure I'm getting chemo? I'm not nauseous, I'm not tired. It's based on the individual per person. These are general side effects and you need to remember, you're an individual with individual side effects so two people, same age, same disease, same regimen, will have totally different side effects. You have to know your body and not be shy. Report all symptoms to your doctor, your whole healthcare team. We're here to help you and don't be shy. Ask questions, bother us. We like you to bother us, okay? So, any questions? Informal, just from my experience with women, if they have children, it's just a question I ask. How was your pregnancy? It's just informal on my part. I find the women that had a lot of morning sickness tend to have a lot of nausea with chemotherapy. And the woman that say, oh, it was a piece of cake. Just my informal, it's not proven by any scientific background or anything, it's just yeah. You don't you really don't know how you're gonna react till you do it. And, uh, about that when it comes to nausea and vomiting, we also tend to know that people who have had exposure to alcohol tend to have less nausea and vomiting as they go through chemotherapy. Something that we found wow. <laughs> no, that's not a that's not an invitation to go to drink. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there. Does age have anything to do with your reactions? Um, it Pretty depends. You are the worst it could be. Or? Pardon me. It depends. In my experience, I've had ninety-year-olds do chemotherapy and say, "Piece of cake," whereas a twenty-year-old is hospitalized with every treatment. It's all on the individual. And you have to look at the whole picture. How are you coming in? How many comorbidities? Of course, if you have diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, that, all those things. But you, it, it's, you can't really generalize. Yes. I, I don't know very much about chemotherapy, and I don't know how much the chemotherapy cocktails will vary from different types of cancers. I would think that somebody who's had colorectal cancer, for instance, is more likely to have gastrointestinal problems, constipation or diarrhea, than somebody being treated, say, for breast cancer. 
I may have that all wrong. Um, but is there any pattern that you see there that somebody being treated for lung cancer is more likely to have some side effect that uh, uh, someone with prostate cancer is not going? It really depends on the agent because a lot of these agents are used to treat multiple cancers. For example, for colorectal cancer, there is a drug that they're using to treat breast cancer also. So it's not so much the disease, it's the agent they use. Okay. Very good question. Any other questions? Well, I would like to also add, it's very important when you're going through chemotherapy or if you're supporting someone who's going through chemotherapy, that you inform your treatment uh, team about all your side effects that you're having. Um, that's why they're here. You're never bothering us. We want to know what's going on with you. Um, it's better for your team to be aware of your side effects than for you to be home and afraid or worried about what you're experiencing. Because many times we have something that we can do for you. We can prescribe you something or give you a piece of advice, but please talk with your treatment plan to me. Um, I have a question about the prostate cancer. Um, I have a prostate club here at the hospital mm -hmm. once a month. Okay. Each meeting that we come to, but there's a different doctor who talks okay. about his particular therapy. Okay. That's all he knows. That's where he makes his money. Over the year or two, there's been so many doctors, and each one says his cure is the best. Mm -hmm. How do we get, how do we find out which is the best? A chemotherapy. Which chemotherapy works for you? Just like there's all the different kinds of breast cancer, the different kinds of prostate cancer. It depends what stage you're at, what you respond to. If you had surgery or if you didn't have surgery. There's a lot of factors that take into consideration. Some people may have prostate cancer and take a pill, whereas some people may just have radiation, whereas it, it is all done on an individual basis. Yeah, of course, but I've had no treatment at all, mm -hmm. but I want to find the best treatment. I want to find the magic pill. Yeah. How do I get somebody who can oversee all the different treatments and say, this is the best? Chemotherapy destroys a lot of tissue and so yes. forth. That is true. So it's, you know. What, what we have at the hospital, what we have what is called tumor boards. They would discuss all the different treatments available. and. Any new, anything that go to conferences, anything new, they will bring back to the practice. So right now, you've never had chemotherapy, is that correct? I haven't had anything. And, and you just, you had surgery. I don't want to get I haven't person. had anything. You haven't had anything. The doctor just want to wait and see. Are you newly diagnosed? I don't want to get into specifics. We I haven't talk. had anything, but I want to find out what the best treatment is. Okay. Each doctor, whatever his treatment is, that's what he swears by, because that's where he makes his money. Okay. You have to meet with uh, an oncologist. You have to meet with someone that you have a connection with, a trust. This is, this is going to be the doctor for the rest of your life. That's the first thing I always tell my patient is trust. You put yourself in his hands, and between the two of you, you come up with a treatment plan. You even though you're diagnosed with cancer, you still run the show. It's your body. So the doctors will give you several options, where the pros and the cons, but you have to have a mutual trust and respect. That's the most important thing. Yeah, but I, I want to find an ecologist who knows all the different treatments, who can tell me what is the best. I've when spoken to some doctors, and I, I talk about the proton that is, well, I don't know anything about it. Because but whatever some, you do, do something. You know. Right. I, because they're all different specialties. Yes. And depending on the stage of your cancer, 
the treatment is appropriate. And a lot of them are inappropriate. They destroy it. one step forward, two steps backwards. Mm -hmm. But whatever they're pushing, whatever their treatment is, that's all they believe in. That's where they make their money. So this is the way, that is why you have to go with someone. You develop a trust and respect and you tell them up front what you need. You have to build a relationship. Yeah, but how can I trust blindly? What you, is the best hospital? Is it I can give, I can give you information on that. The, the National Cancer Institute prescribed the plan for the different kinds of cancer. Every hospital you go to will prescribe that plan based on the NCI, National Cancer Institute recommendation. So you can go to your little community hospital or you can go to NYP or Sloan Kettering and you will get that same treatment. It's where you feel comfortable. We're not here to advocate one hospital. You will get the same treatment if you went to a different state. It's your gut feeling, who you feel comfortable with. At what's comfortable. Yeah, but we're laymen. We know nothing about the medical procedures. Mm -hmm. We need somebody who can tell us which is the best. Do you have family members that can help you? No. no. So you by yourself. I'm by myself. Yeah. So yeah, that's in times like that. You sometimes you said you go to a prostate group. Yes. Do you have you made friends in that group? Yeah, but each one has different treatments. Right. And they're all women like myself. Right. And we know nothing about the game. Well, I have the perfect solution for you. This is a medical library. Antonio is one of our medical librarians. You can come here and you can sit down and you can research all the different options. He can help you with that. This, is, this library is here for patients. You can come in and you can read through and then go to your doctor and say, what do you think of this? Because medicine has changed. It's no longer the doctor telling you to do this and this is the only way. You're a partner in your treatment. You're a lay person, but it's your body. Yeah, but it's finding a doctor you can try. I mean, doctors out of four years of schooling only get 15 hours on nutrition. Whenever I talk to a doctor about nutrition, not only does he not know what I'm talking about, but he has the arrogance to get angry and feel threatened sometimes. So that's the wrong doctor? So yeah. yeah. Obviously, exactly. sure. Yeah. And when you... I when, want to find the right doctor, but... And I, no, I mean to cut you off. When, when you come in for treatment, you have a treatment team. You have your doctor, you have your nurse practitioner or physician assistant, you have a nurse navigator, you have a social worker, you have a dietitian. Everybody who's an expert in their field. The doctor may be an expert in prostate cancer, but he's not an expert in nutrition. That's where the dietitian is. It's a team approach. So you have, it's like you buying a car or something. You have to check out what fits you. It's not a cookie cutter treatment. You have to go with what you feel comfortable with. It's a very difficult decision. I'm not saying it's easy. So. You have to, you know, you have, sometimes you have to go have one, two, three opinions. And you have to be heard. You know, you have, what's most important for a patient, you have to feel that your doctor is hearing you. Do you, do you agree? But how do I find the right doctor? You it's can start off with your insurance company, have them recommend someone, you go meet with that doctor hear what he has to say. Uh, someone diagnose you. One of your doctors diagnose you with prostate cancer. Yes? I need an oncologist who can oversee the, uh, the whole field of all the different treatments. I don't have that much time left. I can't afford to make a mistake. I'm 79. I'm in the geezer class now. I've got maybe 10 years left. So I've got to find the right doctor. There's a lot of bad doctors out there. So you do need to start somewhere, is what she's saying. Start exactly. with your insurance company, yeah. talk to a doctor, make an appointment, make several appointments, 
ask your doc those doctors these questions. That's the best way. You're going to be the best judge for who's right for you. And you can approach these doctors and ask them, this, these are the treatment options I've heard of. What do you think? How do you feel about X, Y, and Z? And you have to fill that out and you have to make that decision for yourself. That's what she's telling you. So you do need to start somewhere. Your insurance company is a great place. Mm -hmm. See what's in your network, what's, your, what's covered. Make those appointments. Start somewhere. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. I donate blood and the blood center is very interested in my platelets. And from what I've read, platelets are used a lot by cancer patients. Yes. Can you explain? You mentioned transfusions. Can you I mentioned a bit about I mentioned that? when we were talking about the red blood cells and anemia. But there's also another um, part of our blood cells that I didn't speak about. Not every um, therapy would cause this, but we can lower how many platelets we have. Um, platelets are, are part of our, which makes us clot. If you don't have enough platelets, you can bleed. Some therapies, in, um, really in different regimens, depending on your disease, a lot of times when we're talking about blood cancers, makes you more at risk of becoming um, domicilia or low platelet level, which puts you at risk for um, bleeding. And so that's why the blood center asks you to please donate. Yes, we <laughs> love we love you. They often can require a lots and lots of platelet transfusion. But this is not something that's common in every single treatment plan and every single disease. We see it a lot more when it comes to our, um, our blood cancers and certain drugs. And this is something that your treatment team will inform you of if, if you're being prescribed a drug, a medication that we know um, can lower the platelets. Some of the things, since we're talking about low platelets, that I um, really like to talk about is um, that didn't come up here is falls. Uh, we talked a lot about infection, but falls is a very dangerous thing. Um, and when you're going through chemotherapy, you're fatigued, you can become anemic, and that puts you at risk for falls. And if you happen to be on a medication where your platelet level is lowered or because of your, um, your cancer, type of cancer, then you're at risk for bleeding. Bleeding is easily seen when it's coming from our nose, or our gums, or our mouth. But when you, if you experience a fall when you're at these risks here, there's bleeding that can happen internally and we're very concerned about that. So I always tell everyone, if you experience a fall, it's important that you call your doctor. I'm seeing the doctor in two days. No, I want you to call the doctor at, at the time of the fall. Because based on, well, actually a series of questions and based on your answer, the doctor may have different recommendations. Maybe we can wait. Maybe we want you to come to the emergency room so we can do a scan to make sure that you're not having internal bleeding. So, uh, did I answer your question okay? And, yes? Is the triple negative breast cancer always treated with chemo and radiation? Yes, uh, good, very good question. Because well, breast cancer happens to be. What was the question? Yeah. The question is, is triple negative breast cancer only treated with chemotherapy and radiation? October is breast cancer month. Breast cancer is my specialty. The tumors could either be positive for estrogen, progesterone, progesterone or there's a protein called HER2 mu. When you're triple negative, you do not, your tumor didn't express any of those, so your only option is chemotherapy. It's a more aggressive kind of breast cancer, but there's a lot of research going on. We have patients that are surviving for decades now. So there's always research going on, but yes, you are correct. The because only I, option is chemotherapy. I saw the, to skip the chemotherapy. Hmm? Was that? I, I saw to skip the chemotherapy because it was uh, disappointing, you know, to read. Um, I, I know that it's very infrequent that kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. To read something chemo might help, some, something like that. I read in one book, and then three oncologists recommended chemo and radiation, but I still thought that I don't want chemo because I don't think. I would survive with this <laughs> Now, there is an oncologist here that uh, she recommended radiation because she saw the side effects of the chemo. And I saw that uh, because 
or my age or something like that, it might be to, you know, to not be alone. Yeah. But as I said before, there's no cookie cutter treatment. You look at the patient's age, their physical condition. You wear the pros and cons. If you have a lot of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to give that person chemotherapy. That's not gonna that's gonna debilitate them. So you and your doctor have to come up with a treatment plan. You are an active part of your care. So that's why Sometimes, if you have a very early stage cancer, the doctor may just opt for radiation. But that's every, you, you can't generalize. That's, everyone is different. You know? Yes. Um, I think it's called Caprilla. Caprilla? Yeah. Caprilla. 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 For my, for my experience, the Keytruda is not a chemotherapy, it's a monoclonal antibody, meaning it works with your immune system to kill the cancer. These are the newer drugs. Some patients get a good response, some don't. There is no magic bullet, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. There is no magic bullet. Because, you know, with the triple negative breast cancers, they're doing a lot of research with the Keytruda also. See, you read it up on your, your, your well, medical journals. Yes, yes. Check it out. Yes, very good. And as I said, always tell my patient, you are your best advocate. Well, you are your best advocate. Well, I can't tell my doctor what to do. <laughs> but you can bring the topic up. Pardon me? I said, I can't tell them what to do. He's gone. She has to tell me what they were doing. But you can be partners in your care. Yes, and then you have a better outcome when your partner's in your care. A very, very good question. Yes. Did, how common is neuropathy, which you didn't mention? Right? You know somebody who was being treated for multiple myeloma, mm -hmm. and he said sometimes the neuropathy was so bad he wanted to cut his hands off. Yes, that's from the chemotherapy he's getting. It depends on the agent. It depends on the agent, and that's why neuropathy, quite a few chemotherapies can cause that. And if the person has a comorbidity, example, diabetes, they're more prone to, or they have peripheral vas vascular disease, the circulation is not good. If there's no comorbidity, and um, the person successfully concludes the course of treatment, does the neuropathy fade, or that's a permanent body change? Some people get some improvement, and some people don't. Yeah, also, unfortunately. It also depends on the degree that you experience. And while you're getting these agents, it's something that your nurse and your physician would assess with you constantly to see if you're experiencing it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes if it gets to a certain level, um, where it may lead to permanent neuropathy, um, it will lead to maybe changing treatment. <clears throat> Which is not the worst thing to happen. Um, they're always looking at making sure that the benefit outweighs the risk for you whenever you're receiving any kind of treatment. What is neuropathy? Numbness and tingling in your extremities. It's like frostbite almost. There's a question. You have a question? No. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Question. Sure. For well, more medicine cancer treatments, mm -hmm. I know it differs because I age with different criteria. Mm -hmm. But in those for, for medicine versus cancer, mm -hmm. see, would you recommend the chemo versus radiation or both? It depends on the type of breast cancer, what treatments the patients had before, and the patient performance status. So it's it's they take many factors into consideration, and sometimes they get a chemo pill rather than an IV chemotherapy. You can't, as I say, you can't generalize, but that look at the whole picture. You have to weigh the you one to have quality of life. Doesn't make sense to get a chemo that's gonna cure you but you have no quality of life. What's the point? So
So you have to weigh the pros and cons. And as I said, I always tell my patients, you are your best advocate. You speak up, you ask questions. And for example, with the neuropathy, some patients will deny having neuropathy because they don't want the doctor to stop treatment. If I stop treatment, I'm gonna get worse. But you're harming yourself. There are other agents we can use. So I always say, before coming, you have to re you have to have a relationship. This is a doctor that's going to treat you for the rest of your life. If you don't like the doctor, get a new one. Mm -hmm. Is that a side effect of uh, chemo, chemo, what they call chemo brain frequent or permanent? It's, it's a lot of a lot of the, it has they have done studies and there it, it is a phenomenon called chemo brain where you get a little foggy and I can't quote exactly what percentage of patients get it but we know now how to help them you know using cognitive therapy you know you do like a crossword puzzle you do even like something simple like using the adult coloring books. You can increase your concentration, little things. So uh, um, PT and occupational therapy departments are very involved with that. Because before in the past, I've been doing this almost 30 years, they would say, oh, that's nothing. But it is, it is, some people do experience this. And also